Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another installment of the EBI Seminar Series on Science Communications. I'm joined today by Chiago Correa. Chiago is the Energy and Bioscience Institute's Strategic Planning and Development Director. He aims to connect Berkeley researchers with corporations to promote and initiate sustainable solutions. How are you doing today, Chiago? Good. Thank you, Logan. And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit about EBI and also a little bit about um, the, the hurdles and the ways that we, we try to break the bridge in the communication aspects between, you know, the private sector and the academic institutions. So thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Of course. And thank you for joining us for this conversation. So I'm going to move into our first question, which is to just give a little bit of background. Could you give us a de more detailed description of your role at the EBI? Yeah. And I actually am going to step back a little bit and talk a little bit to what we do at EBI first because then I think it makes it uh, uh, easier to understand about the role. So in a very simple couple words, what we do at ABI, we do funding research here, basically. And by that, we mean that um, we try to seek, you know, uh, to build partnerships, you know, successful strategic partnerships with, with, with in industrial sponsors. So basically any industry that has strong commitment and is serious about sustainability, we're very interested to talk about it and to see if you can build a partnership. And by that, I mean like companies that are want to, you know, invest in new technologies tied to clean energy, you know, green chemistry or sustainable mining or sustainable agricultural practices, carbon sequestration, circularity, any of those aspects that's going to help us to tackle the climate change, you know, to, to mitigate that climate change, we are interested to talk to those companies and see if we can uh, develop our partnerships so they can fund research across the campuses that are part of EBI. So that being said, my main role here is actually to find strategies to identify those companies. And once we identify those companies, then it's try to to bring them to our campuses and show like, listen, let's build up a partnership here uh, uh, with EBI. So that's kind of the main aspect of this role here. Perfect. So moving a little bit more broadly, the main partnerships that comprise the EBI is between UC Berkeley, the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, and then the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. How does this partnership operate? Yeah. Um, First of all, that's a unique partnership. You know, it's basically you have, it's one single contract. We access the three top tier institutions that you just mentioned about it. And that's unique. Actually, we're like kind of the trailblazers when EBI was created. So it, it's very special because, you know, throughout those three institutions that you just talk about it, um, a sponsor can actually have access to over 7,500 faculties and postdocs and over 100,000 students. And I'm not even talking about the cutting edge lab capabilities that we have across the three campuses. So it's a really unique model. And I guarantee to you, Logan, if you have a problem, a solution that your company is trying to, to solve, I guarantee that you can find at least one, if not dozens of researchers that are working in that field area across the three campus. So I think this, the EBI model, it's, it's, it's very unique and I'm not totally sure if there is anything like this across uh, United States, for example, and even Europe. So getting a little bit more specific on the matter of strengths between the EBI and its partnerships, how can this operating model be time and resource efficient for a given company considering the vast amount of researchers they get to choose from? And then with that, how can a company know what is the best fit researcher for their needs and the technology they're trying to solve? Yeah, well, that's, yeah, that's a really good question. And I think that's just you know, I think any company that's trying to build those partnerships with academic institutions are going to face this problem, right? How do you navigate through campus without being there? Even if you're alumni from the company, you know, uh, it's extremely complicated. And especially because, as I just mentioned, EBI has this huge portfolio of researchers. How a company is going to select the best professors, the best researchers to work in that given problem? That's extremely time consuming, as you just pointed out. So, but 
we have a very um, efficient model here that actually we have stress tests for 16 years since EBI was created, which I think it's, it's, it's really critical. And we call the, it's a request for proposal. That basically how it works. So let me try to explain a little bit. So, we, you know, we build a relationship, a partnership with a sponsor, and then we build a technical committee meeting with the sponsor, with the company and the professors here, uh, a, a few professors at EBI. And together, the professors, that, you know, here are going to work together with the companies to build a call for proposal. And basically, with the call for proposal, we send it out for, across the three campuses. And, um, and then that's the chance that we have to be able to identify some of those researchers that work in that given area. So I, I think this is ex extremely, extremely powerful because otherwise it would be very difficult for a company to identify that. So this model actually um, also allows the companies to build a much longer term strategic partnership rather than if like you know, ad hoc basis, like, okay, I identify this professor. And then you have to negotiate IP contracts, you know, the a master agreement with every single professor that you want to do the research with. That would be extremely time consuming for the legal team of the company. But what we do here at ABI, we make one single agreement for that company to be able to work with this the, the portfolio tries the three campuses. So it's a win situation for the company, but it's also a win situation for the researchers because when we design those uh, master agreements, we really want to protect the inventor side, you know, the, the side of the inventor that's going to be doing the research. And a lot of the times, the, the, the researchers, they don't have that, that, that experience build those contracts, and they don't even have much of the time to do that. So we, we actually, uh, we, we, we leverage the resource that we have on campus to, to be able to design those contracts to help the researchers uh, 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 across campus. So just back to your questions here, uh, first, we have this request for proposal, which is very effective to identify the right research for the right problem that the, the sponsors have. And then we also accelerate the process by uh, being able to have a centralized team here that helps to build just one single contract that we protect the inventor, but we also have the company to streamline the whole approach. Perfect. Thank you so, for such an in-depth answer. I think your answer really illuminates what all the strengths and how the operating model works to the benefit of both the researchers and the company. Mm -hmm. So once the, all the technicalities are figured out and the EBI has paired companies with researchers, going into a more overarching question, what do you think are the EBI's goals in the context of scientific development and collaboration? Yeah. So as as I, I talked before, you know, um, one of my main roles here is to identify the companies that we think there is a synergy, companies that are very serious about, you know, sustainability, that have a strong commitment to sustainability. So the first the first goal here is to filter out, okay, to identify, you know, those companies. And, and the way that we do that is to basically, um, is to going through a lot of the materials that are, are publicly available. It would be, it would be amazing to see how much information you can get in terms of the strategy, the sustainability reports, everything that you know they tend to release in those investors' uh, uh, stakeholder meetings that they have. So once we understand their, line, their, their business, their products, their missions, then we have a better understand if there is an alignment between our missions and as, as an institute and the directions that they wanna go. So going on to our next question, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the difficulties in building partnerships now that we've highlighted the strengths of it. So again, what do you think are the difficulties in building partnerships? Yeah, um, you know, the strengths, as we pointed out, it, it, it's, you know, it's can be a very, it can be a win-win situation, right, for the industry and for the academia. So I, we don't have to elaborate any further on that. But the, the challenges are, I think it, it sits within the the fact that there is a cultural difference between um, the industry, the governance, how the how a company works versus the university. So let me try to give a couple of examples here. 
So in a, in a universe, we know it's a very decentralized model, right? Um, researchers and professors, they have a high autonomy, right? And, and, and it is a decentralized governance model. Whereas uh, in the industry, and I work for a major energy corporation for 12 years, was we have a very centralized model. We all understand the work chart, you know, we all understand how the information has to flow when we are city, sitting in a, in a corporation. Um, so that the aspect of the governance, I think creates a lot of hurdles when it's trying to establish that relationship because of this decentralized versus centralized. And there is also a language component, you know, in, in the business side, we use a lot of jargons, the business jargons, right? And in and, and, and the industry, it's very scientific driven. You know the the style of communications are also very different. So in you know like yeah, uh, a decision maker in a, in a company that if you're trying to establish those partnerships, for example, a decision maker is often not a scientist. It could be, but probably hasn't been a lab for the last 10, 15 years. Um, so here are, are some of those barriers, right? We're almost speaking kind of different languages here, and I think. Uh, uh, that causes some some difficulty on establishing this, the relationship. So expanding a little bit beyond the EBI, why do you think it's important for scientific organizations beyond just ourselves to collaborate among each other? Yeah, that, that's also a very good question. You know, um, I think what we're facing this climate crisis right now at the moment. And I believe that um, the... the the ongoing interdisciplinary collaboration between labs or between the departments is no longer enough. I think we need something even more powerful to be able to, to tackle the climate crisis that we're going through. And um, so I, I like to use this term, um, we need a transdisciplinary approach here. And by that, I mean, we it's not only just the, the academic institutions that have to work together, but it's also the, the private sector you know, bringing uh, the industry together because they are the ones that really can scale a project, uh, scale a techno a new technology. If it just stays in the lab, we we're, we can do few trials here at the universities and the academic institutions, but to really take to the next level, I think we do need the private sector and we also need the, the government, you know, to, to, to for the funding purposes, but also for the policies. And we need the society, we need to work with the communities, you know, to establish some of these new technologies. So back to EBI again, what I think it's, the, it's, it's such a good model because when EBI was created, it, it was built on the, on the context of being a triple helic is structure because EBI connects, you know, the institutions that we talk about it, but also the private sector that to fund the research and be able to scale up. And but also with the with the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, which is a government entity, is also allows us to have the uh, government component. And EBI is also part of the, the UC Berkeley campus, you know, that we have our education and outreach components. So with that, we have this sort of these four key elements that I think it's necessary to really tackle this giant kind of challenge that we have uh, uh, right now, which is, you know, in the climate change. So I think we have all those four components within this, this EBI structure that connects government, society, private sector, and academic institutions. Perfect. So moving into our last question, this topic of this seminar series is science communication. So ending on this last note, what kind of improvements do you think there need to be among scientific structures and how they scientifically communicate among one another? Yeah, no, that, that's, that's a very good question. And uh, we talk about this transdisciplinary kind of framework, right? And so we basically we're trying to put all those groups and sectors to all work together towards, you know, a single objective. And again, you know, that's not always... Uh, easy, you know, thing to do because people speak almost like different languages, you know, use different terminologies. So, um, and we do, we do have to be able to understand, um, you know, what where that group, the sector of the economy or the community is talking about it. And um, and the example that I have seen here, you know, um, in the university, most of the faculties and the staff they have spent most of their career, if not all, 
in the academic institution. And we haven't had much experience and opportunity to be on the business side. And I think actually, and you know, because I came from the business side, I have been noticing that how important it is to um to have that background because it really allows us to to try to to cross that 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 bridge um and 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 make us understand each other a little bit more. So I think it would be nice actually if we can start hiring more people um that have a little bit of a business experience on the staff side. I also have seen now that a lot of staffs are taking sabbatical actually to work on you know to take a sabbatical to work in a company for a year or so and when they come back actually they 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 look at problems very differently and they also are much more um much more open to to build those projects you know i think they understand the problems in a, in a different angle and I, and i think that's really really valid and also for the students you know um I, I think it's really nice when we build those partnerships is also very important for the students because offer opportunities for the students to have to work on with real, you know, real business problems, you know, to try to solve real problems, open opportunities for network, for internships and 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 to to basically build that bridge between you know the, the corporate world but also the academic world. So I, I think it's uh I think basically that that you know be able to work across all those areas and to have exposure to those areas. I think it's it, it can be very valid for us to move this uh, you know to 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 be more effective how we communicate among each other because as I said we're going to need everybody to work together towards to find the new solutions here for the future uh, to tackle the you know the climate crisis that we are going through right now. Yeah, absolutely. And expanding a little bit on what you're saying about students and undergrads um, trying to pursue both business and science. I know even at UC Berkeley, we have programs where the um, program is aiming to combine science and business so that the students are more equipped so that when they enter the field, they have this more robust knowledge of how they can combine those two spheres. So absolutely seeing what you're saying um, taking place in the real world. But with that note of um, looking forward into the future, that just about does it for all of our questions. So thank you so much for joining us. We wish you all the best in your future endeavors. So thank you so much. Thank you, Logan. Thank you very much for, for the opportunity and for organizing this. Much appreciated. Thank you for checking out the EBI seminar series on science communication. If you've enjoyed this video, please feel free to like and subscribe to our channel for more content on how science is communicated. Be sure to follow along for future installments or check out our previous series and explore our social media, which are all linked in the description below. Thank you for watching and see you next time.